It gives me great pleasure to introduce a Silicon Valley entrepreneur, leader, and industry influencer who co-founded the Extreme Tech Challenge and made it a reality. Young Son is the corporate president and chief strategy officer of Samsung Electronics. He is also chairman of the board of Harman International Industries. He leads Samsung's strategy for global innovation, investment, and new business creation, and has led the company's $8 billion acquisition of Harman. Before joining Samsung Electronics, Young served as the CEO of two successful public Silicon Valley companies and on the boards of Arm, Symer, ASML, and others. Under his leadership as CEO and board member, he took PLX Technologies, Synex Technologies, and Infi Public. He was also a seed investor in some of the industry's most innovative companies, including Fungible, GraphCore, and Zoom. Young also serves on the MIT Sloan School North America Board, is an advisor to the private equity firm Silver Lake Partners, and is a member of the board of directors at Cadence. He is also a board member at the Global Semiconductor Alliance and is an advisor for the University of California Innovation Council. Today, Young will be in conversation with Jerry Yang. Jerry, as you know, co-founded Yahoo in 1995 and served on the board of directors until January 2012. While at Yahoo, he led several initiatives including two of the biggest investments in the internet sector, Yahoo Japan and Alibaba Group. Jerry currently works with and invests in technology entrepreneurs through AME Cloud Ventures, his innovation investment firm. He serves as director of the board of Workday Incorporated, Lenovo Group, and Alibaba Group. He also serves on a number of his portfolio boards. He also serves on the Stanford University's Board of Trustees, is a board member for the National Committee of U.S.-China Relations, the Brookings China Advisory Council, the Committee of 100, and the Council of Foreign Relations. Please join me in welcoming Young and Jerry as they talk to us about scaling up. Young, take it away. Okay, Jerry, good morning. I hope you're doing well. Great. So let's start with how you're surviving in time like this. How are you managing your schedule, your daily routines? Well, thank you for having me. And well, first of all, I think this is the new reality. Uh, and I think there are a lot of positives and negatives, as we all know. Fortunately for our profession, we are able to um, work with people around the world. In fact, in many ways, things like this is much more possible. You can grab speakers from around the world and by the way, Tehi is a, a tough act to follow. So uh, uh, I always feel like I learned something from hearing his presentations. Um, but also, unfortunately, I think there are people in the world that um, cannot work from home or cannot work by Zoom. And, um, and we're seeing some real challenges as here in California, around the United States, but elsewhere in the world where I know many of you are, um, we're balancing between the challenges of economic um, damage versus potential health and public health. And, and this is stuff that I don't think uh, we would certainly, uh, most of us in our lifetime have not seen. And I think it will define our generation um, depending how we deal with it and how do we, how do we really uh, stay agile. And many of your uh, projects are based on uh, the current crisis. And I think um, these are sort of the, the, the way in which innovation invention comes out of necessity uh, young I, I think we all agree with that and then of course last three weeks in the United States we've seen um, unprecedented really sort of race upheavals uh, and um, and it's a, a, a time for deep reflection to be quite honest I think we all um, uh, have to think hard about um, what it is that we can do better. And I know not all of you are in the United States, but I think this uh, set of incidents in the US has had repercussions around the world. And so hopefully um, uh, it, it brings us uh, to sort of facing um, multiple crises at once, it allows us to really think about what is important and how do we get along. And um, in my mind, and it's not a necessarily political statement, but I just feel uh, unity and, and, and going forward together as a group rather than being divided is, is, is you know, we have, to, we have to go forward together as a, as a, in a unified way. Right. I think maybe because we are all 
at home and we are more locked in, maybe also have more time to reflect rather than running around with our own daily affairs. Indeed. Maybe, uh, maybe, you know, we all, um, uh, have, uh, obviously, you know, we spend in my case, spend a lot of time on family. Um, so that, that, that obviously creates a sense of belonging and, and our, our structure. Um, but also, you know, I have to, I have two younger girls and I have to explain to them why does George Floyd matter? Why does public health and pandemics matter? Why does, um, uh, you know, things happening to them? And this is quite frankly, their generation, right? This is uh, the kinds of issues they have to deal with. And, and for entrepreneurs and people who are in our, in your competition, those are, these are the issues that we need to solve. Otherwise um, we're passing on to our future generations, much bigger problems than we face. I, I joke, uh, you know, young, uh, I think it was two weeks ago when, we were all at home watching um, two American astronauts get launched into space. Uh, we were having race riots here in the United States in the cities of the United States. And uh, the United States is on the verge of a, a very big tension confrontation with another Asian nation. And, um, and this could have been 1968, the, day, the year I was born when the US went to space into the moon and um, race riots and obviously a Vietnam War. 50 years later, 51 years later, this is, uh, you know, tensions with China, um, still race riots and still sending people to the space station. So um, in some ways, things haven't changed all that much in 50 years. Well, that's uh, actually very interesting given amount of technology, the changes that happens in our society, some problems repeat. And, you know, I guess this is why people use historians to say, history of peace in the past and some of the things that to do with us not changing all the technology and society and the way we live changes. Um, let's kind of go back a little bit since we're talking about history because you really are a pioneer in internet economy. So let's go back when you were at Stanford and how you kind of began because there are many entrepreneurs here they are struggling and thinking about their own ideas, how they build a company it would be great if you can share some of your experience of how you began, how you start, and what are some of the challenges you have to deal with. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, there's various uh, uh, theories about uh, startups and how we might be successful. Um, I, you know, and, and I was talking with um, another venture capitalist, uh, Jeff, Jeff Jordan from um, Entries and Horus the other day, and he just posted a blog about, you know, there are no bad ideas, just bad timing, right? So, uh, and, and I think about Yahoo in many ways, obviously, um, I, I don't want to take anything away from our founding team, myself, David Philo, uh, and our early executive team. But, you know, it, it was clearly that we, we worked very, very hard. We, we, we had the, the luxury of um, building and incubating many ways at Stanford. So if you think about Stanford in 1994, 1993, uh, we have one of the biggest internet connections around the world coming into the, the, the department that David and I were at. Um, and we were doing our PhD thesis, so we, we, we didn't really have a, um, uh, a solid idea of creating Yahoo as a business in the beginning. So essentially, we, had, we didn't know it, but we had an incubator and an accelerator at Stanford at one of the best infrastructures. We had, you know, top-of-the-line workstations, things like that, to build this hobby essentially right this thing was not a um real business and um and that year or so of incubation i think really allowed us to take the idea into a a you know what i call the timing uh, match where uh the world was you know re really it was ready for something that helps indexing the internet and being able to um you know kind of for us jump off the the leap board into the information revolution but um uh, but, but in many ways, um, once we decided to build a business young and, and, you know, you've seen this, it's, um, it's a mad dash, right? You have to continue to run as fast as you can. You have to hire, you have to innovate, you have to productize, you have to scale. Um, and, and for us, I think in the first two or three years, it felt like it was just a, um, 
everything was sort of accelerated on steroids. There was no sort of time to plan. Uh, I don't remember writing a, a, a three-year plan until well into like sort of the late 90s. So, um, so you know, when, when you have this massive tide of, of market change, uh, you, 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 you're, you're just running as fast as you can to, to meet your product market fit um, rather than trying to plan for it and wait for it. Um, so uh, it's very unusual. I mean, I think Yahoo is still one of those stories that I haven't seen in since, you know, obviously there are plenty of very successful companies since, but, but, but Yahoo was very much a, um, uh, you know, we, we caught the tide at the right time with the right team and, um, and we wrote it for, for quite a while. I mean, you were really in a way creating first marketplace and, I think Tay Nam earlier talked about in his Survivor and Thriver uh, lecture, hitting the wave properly. You know, you could be too early, yes. crashing, or you could be too late, missing out the wave. And hitting that wave and riding it at the right moment, it seems to be that was your first big wave there. Yes, yeah. And staying, and staying on the wave, you know, I mean, yeah. not to use this overusing surfing analogy. I'm a terrible yeah. surfer, but, uh, but when you catch it, you, you want to stay on it as long as you can. And right. sometimes um, uh, staying on it means you don't want to try too hard. And sometimes you want to make sure you see where the wave is headed. And, and, and I, I think, um, you know, uh, being able to be at a, um, sort of that initial wave of internet information industry changing was um, was was fascinating because we were redefining the industry, right? We were setting pro you know ad sizes on internet. So sorry, anybody who don't like banners, you know that was our fault. And um, and pricing and how do we how do we uh, create advertising logs to be accountable for advertisers, or how do we set up pricing for you know is a price per you know, uh, view or as a price per click, as a price per acquisition, all these things that nobody had any idea of creating advertising industry on the internet, we were at the forefront of. So, um, so there was this phase where we, you were setting the rules, which is, uh, which thinking back about it was like, it's crazy um, mm -hmm. because now a lot of those things are the industry standard. Yeah. And so tell us about Yahoo Japan, especially meeting with Masa Ishisan, yeah. The founder of the South Bank. That must be an interesting experience as well. Yeah, I, I would say um, we were barely into uh, building Yahoo when we first met with um, one of Masa's uh, um, companies, which at the time was called Zip Davis, which is a large uh, technology publisher. Mm -hmm. I remember and, that. Yeah, and CEO of, of Zip was uh, Eric, is Eric Hippo, and Eric... Um, He's now at his own angel firm, but you know, he, he, he saw the potential because so much of what we did was like publishing. So, so he said, look, you know, Ziff really want to get involved, but Ziff was being bought by SoftBank at the time. And so he introduced us to Masayoshi Song and Masa, uh, you know, this was 1995. So, you know, Masa hasn't changed in 25 years and uh, he was in full of enthusiasm. Um, he really felt strongly about uh, where we were headed. He, he really bought into our vision. So I think the idea was to, for him to invest in Yahoo, but he also said, look, um, as part of the investment, you have to build Yahoo Japan. And I think going to Japan in 1996 was the last thing on our minds, right? I mean, we were barely 45, 50 people. We were running crazy in the United States, trying to build our services. Um, but Masa was very persuasive. He said, look, you just have to show up. You have to show up with your know-how, you have to have some code, but I'll provide my best management team. I'll provide the people. You just have to figure out how to get us off the ground. And so, um, so we did it. We, we went there in 1996. We were barely a public company. It was quite a crazy endeavor, but he did what he promised. He was the best partner. He had a great management team. His brother, Taizo, was one of the surfers. So it was all in for him. And uh, without his sort of insistence, we would have never gone to Japan. And without his sort of partnership, we would have never been successful. And today, still, I think Yahoo Japan is uh, mm -hmm. still a very big part of the, uh, the internet scene in Japan. So in some ways, when you're going to another market, it doesn't have to be your own way. Maybe finding the right partner is not a bad way to go it in a time when the waves are coming. You really cannot catch all the waves, so maybe you have to replicate it. 
Yeah, I, I think so. And, and we've done many partnerships that worked out unbelievably well, and we've done a lot of partnerships that didn't work well. And so, um, but I think when the market is expanding, as you say, so rapidly, um, it, it, you know, you can't be too greedy. A lot of people get caught up in, we don't have enough control. We don't have, and, and of course, um, those are choices you have to make at the time. There's no right way, right? And, and many companies have done very well by maintaining control and just being slower. But for us, especially in a market like Japan, uh, where we are, you know, a media company, so the cultural and the, the way in which um, content was going to get created, those are all going to be so different from the way we were doing in the United States that I think a partner made a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Jerry, also, uh, you are expanded in China as well. It's the foundation, uh, founding of Alibaba is something you're involved with, Jack Ma. So that would be another great story you can share with. Yeah, yeah. and, uh, uh, you know, I, I would say that um, I've given many talks that says I'm one of the luckiest people you ever meet. And um, I, you know, was born in Taiwan and uh, came to the United States and, and had never gone back uh, to China or, or Taiwan. So my first time back in China was 1997 for some kind of speech. And, um, and, the, and the government ministry, local ministry in China sent a kind of an interpreter and, and, the, and a, 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 a guide or, or handler for me. And that person was Jack Ma. And so you just can't make this stuff up. You can't really uh, create history. You can't, you know, Hollywood scripts don't write things like this. So, um, so I met Jack and, and we, we were, um, uh, you know, he was very curious about the internet at the time and, and we sort of went our own separate ways. And I, I think it was later, a couple of years later, maybe, um, when Yahoo China was trying to compete in the auction and commerce area. And we were just, you know, facing very stiff competition from the local player called Taobao. And, and I said, you know, who's, who's behind this Taobao? And our team says, well, this guy named Jack Ma. And, and I, I said, wow, I wonder if it's the same Jack that I met a few years ago. And it turns out to be Jack. And, and, and we, we reconnected and we um, felt like at the time that, um, that, that he needed capital and we were able to uh, invest in him um, in 2000, in, you know, sort of mid early 2000s. And that turned out obviously being uh, one of the best investments, but also, um, it really allowed me sort of a front row seat to see a great entrepreneur uh, build his business because, um, you know, to the point that you talked about earlier of a founder CEO, you know, Jack had all the qualities of um, um, really being able to scale with his business. And, uh, and, 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 you know, to this day, I'm still uh, serving on his board, but it's a very, it's a, it's a, it's an incredible journey to catch, um, the China internet market in the late nineties, early two thousands, and then to catch it with Alibaba, which is one of the leaders in that business. You got that, what they call in Hawaii, big kauna, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I've, I've gotten slammed by the wave a few times too. And, and those of you who know my history, but right. I, I don't think, you know, I, I think uh, I, I of course look at it with the positives and experience because I feel now my third career after I left Yahoo 2012, um, I've had the good fortune of meeting you and, and Bill Tai and Tehi and, and, um, and as investors, uh, I feel it, it's, uh, um, it, it's so rewarding to find companies, finding entrepreneurs, um, and to be able to help them. And obviously if they're successful, we're successful. So, uh, so this, this third, you know, sort of third career of me or, or second career, but, you know, sort of third phase of having built Yahoo, having built Yahoo in Asia through China and Japan. And now, I am um, an investor in tech businesses that uh, that has been a great ride. I didn't think I was going to be doing this. You know, it's been eight years now and, and I, I didn't think I was going to do it for that long. I thought I'd be starting another business for sure. But so far, I'm having a great time. That's great. So as a, a VC now, your third uh, opportunity to look at new things, what other areas are you looking at or in case the, some of entrepreneurs in the show are interested in looking at, you know, in, in touch with you? Yeah, and, and I've I've seen some of the the the, the brief things, and um, you know my 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 thesis is very simple, which is you know I believed in 2012 this is you know just the beginning of big data, just the beginning of um, sort of data enabled businesses, and 
And our goal is to follow what data will do to transform and disrupt the mainstream. And, um, and so it's not a surprise that we uh, invest in companies like Zoom, um, uh, but we, we also invested in, you know, uh, obviously sort of the harder tech, what we call deep tech. So everything from space tech to, I know there's some food tech businesses here. Uh, we've done AI robotics. Um, we've done um, your more traditional SaaS businesses. Uh, but, but, you know, I, I think as we sit here today and you look at the next 10 years, and, and that's kind of the horizon you have to take as, a, as an early stage investor, um, uh, there are the trends that we see, which is, you know, is it, um, is it energy? Is it uh, sustainable businesses? Is it um, uh, tech businesses that uh, allow um, sort of more um, – uh, changes in the life science area. And I would say, you know, last five years young, I, I, I'm not a biologist, but I feel, you know, the 20, the 21st century, this century is the century of biology. So as digital and life sciences start to come together, we started to really invest in some of those businesses. Especially um, now when we are going through such a big pandemic, we're yes. realizing the limitation of our ability to manage and understand biology. And the question really is, can tech entrepreneurs help along with biology to make some changes? And that's the big bet. And I, I, I believe it's possible, you know, when you get a data, you know, bioinformatics uh, person with a big data scientist, uh, you know, usually some magic can happen there. But, um, but yes, you're right. I mean, for example, you know, you think about um, the production of vaccines, the production about finding therapeutics or finding drugs. These are all things that if they were purely digital, we'd be done by now, right? I mean, we were able to produce things, uh, scale up in, 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 in billions pretty quickly. One of the things I did with my neighbor was actually getting involved in developing a vaccine company ah. because it turned out there are some really great technologies that are being developed for gene therapy. And using the uh, uh, you know, gene sequencing has been so cheap, you know, we have the code. Now the question is how they mo modify the code Yes. So it can be in certain being able to create protein. And it's a very interesting way of changing, using really, if you think about it, compute technology, optical technology, sequencing technology, and then using biology to test in an animal protein way to see how your antibody is going to recognize and react. Yeah, well, that's exactly right. And, and, um, and, and, and you know, and, and so many of the companies that we have been involved with are, you know, involved in editing or, 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 you know, producing genes or, or, um, printing genes, you know, how do you get, you could right now we can read genes very easily. How do you, how do you print a lot of new genes or, or once you decide what to print, how do you get them to scale? Right. So, uh, many things that we learn in information technology, IT, uh, you know, can be translated to biology. We just need to, we need to, we need to really invest in that. But, you know, I think it's funny how we're also learning from biology to apply to our brain, right? We're, we're simulating our brain, the power, the performance, and in, in, in terms of architecture to do the data processing that are much more narrow and broader, but shallower way of compute, uh, being able to handle so many different inputs so it's been interesting how uh, biology and technology are helping each other to accelerate the innovation. Young, Jerry, I mean, that conversation you had was gold, truly, and uh, phenomenal. And we wanted to give a few minutes for some questions from the audience. Yeah. Um, so a question for Jerry uh, from David C. Um, any advice for a company to tell this story uh, when it's rooted in four different sectors, carbon tech, hydrogen economy, industrial, synthetic biotech, and agri-food. Wow. Um, you know, my, my uh, and David, I, I don't know exactly what stage you're at, but my, my, my sense is, um, you know, you, you, there, there are a lot of um, buzzwords in, 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 in the venture business and, and there's a lot of buzzwords and people uh, because there's so many venture capitalists now, there's so much capital um, that uh, my advice would be to pick one that you think to, to pick the sector that is really your most, um, uh, you know, sort of high potential and most passion driven, meaning uh, 
you know, you don't want to try to fit your company into hot areas. You want your company to define the hot area. So, um, so again, not knowing which one of these things are sort of your uh, core competency, um, because, because a lot of these hot areas come and go. And my, my lesson has been, you know, uh, you know, we, 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 for example, invested in a lot of um, early gig economy, um, you know, companies like DD and, and, uh, and Rideshare and things like that. And you would think those are, you know, can you imagine five years ago, those are the hottest companies around. And now, you know, they're, uh, they're all suffering um, deeply. So I, I just wouldn't chase things. I was really sort of say, you know, here's a future that I envision. Here's where my product and my company can fit and tell the story around that value proposition. And if other hot areas kind of gravitate towards it and stick to it magnetically, great. But if not, um, uh, you know, obviously you want to be relevant, but, um, but I, I would just be careful of over, um, uh, you know, overdo it. Um, let's see, how do you design partnerships? I'll read, I'll read it if that's, uh, if there's more, at least. Yeah, that's fine, Jerry. Okay. Uh, the partnership question. Oh, okay. You guys are going to overwhelm my chat box here. Um, <laughs> the, 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 the thing about partnerships is trust. And I would say that, you know, our initial partnership agreement with Masa in Japan was like a two pager MOU. And, um, and, you know, that had to cover IP, that had to cover brand, that had to cover all the commercial agreements. Um, and, and we hardly modify that for almost 10 years. And so I think this idea of, you know, being able to look somebody in the eye or in a camera and be able to trust that person and say, you know what, whatever we agree on, we're going to work through all the challenges because we knew way less than what we didn't know. I mean, you think about what we had to tackle, we probably knew about 1% and then the 99% you had to go invent together. So I think partnerships are our trust. I, I think a lot of times people get bogged down in lawyers and languages and things like that. And, and if you want to go build something big, almost always you have to find a partner that you could just trust implicitly. And, and, and of course you had to protect yourself, but, but you also want to make sure you don't, you know, you don't sort of second guess your partner from 6,000 miles away. Jeremy, thanks a lot. I really appreciate your time today. Um, yeah, yeah, it's great. And then we'll, we'll, you know, I'll catch up with you soon and yeah, we'll, we'll, all you. we'll, we'll be um, uh, watching and hoping to see uh, some of the great uh, results in, in a month or so. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jerry. Thanks, Ajit. Bye-bye.